Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to one of my videos. Uh, in today's video, I want to talk about the difference between gross tonnage and net tonnage. Um, why I have made this video? Uh, well, in the past, uh, in one of my videos, I actually defined uh, the, I provided the definition of gross tonnage and net tonnage. I also showed the formula for its calculation, uh, the numerical formula for its calculation. But uh, I have uh, received a few queries from some of my students where they do not really understand because they cannot visualize uh, what is gross tonnage and net tonnage. So I thought I'll uh, show you uh, uh, by picture, by a picture, by a, uh, and show you define the areas of a ship. Uh, which are included in the calculation of gross tonnage and net tonnage so that you get a good understanding of it. I'll also provide the definition again and uh, the link to my previous videos where I have actually defined gross tonnage and net tonnage and given the formulas for calculation. Uh, you can find it in the description section below and you can watch that video as well. My whole idea behind making these videos is for you to prepare for your exam as well as to increase your knowledge for your oral examination. So whether you are appearing for written examination, oral examination or whether you just just starting out in much Navy uh, or you are an experienced seafarer, the whole idea behind my these videos is for you to be able to understand uh, some of these obstruse uh, 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 concepts or these complicated concepts or some of the things that you cannot visualize. Uh, so let me start. So I'll show you the difference between gross tonnage and net tonnage. But before I do that, I want to uh, also explain some of the other terms that I feel is important for you guys to know. So let's get started. So the first term that I want to discuss is the shear of a vessel. So as you can see, the shear of a vessel is actually the upward rise of a uh, ship's deck from the mid length towards the bow uh, and or or towards the stern. So the shear actually gives the vessel extra reserve buoyancy at the stem and the stern which helps in the flotation of a vessel in case there is any kind of bilging or any hole uh, develops in a ship due to which water ingress is taking place. Now, if you see the picture here, you can see the shear line is uh, very visible in this picture and you can see how the deck line or the uh, deck from the mid length is rising towards the ship's bow. So it could also be towards the ship's turn, but here, of course, it is towards the ship's bow. So that is your shear. And then uh, I want to explain what is camber. Now, the camber, uh, as you see in the drawing here, is the transverse curvature of the weather duck deck. So that transverse curvature of the weather deck is provided for strengthening as well as for draining of water. Uh, now this uh, curvature helps to ensure sufficient drainage of any water that may collect on deck due to either rain or deck washing or due to any kind of spillage. Uh, then we have a rise of floor. So you can see in the picture here rise of floor. The rise of floor uh, is uh, usual to some type of vessels like tugboats and fishing boats. Now this is the upward deviation from the baseline of the lower edges of the floors from the keel towards the bilges in order to collect the water inside the hull near the center line for easy pumping. All right, so as the water gets collected in these areas, you can easily pump it out. So this was used in all ships, but uh, out of fashion in large ships today. This is not so prevalent in uh, modern day ships, but it used to be very prevalent in the olden day ships. And nowadays the modern day ships sort of have uh, flat bottoms. Uh, then we move to bilge radius. As you can see, it gives the actually the bilge radius of the ship. It's pretty straightforward. So the bilge radius actually defines the radius of the bilge from which uh, you can pump out this water that if it gets collected into these, uh, these areas. Uh, then uh, I want to talk about uh, what you see here is an example of a ship with a small uh, depth actually. And uh, I want to talk about a little bit about the uh, length to breadth ratio. So the ratio of length and breadth uh, can differ quite significantly depending on the type of vessels. Now common values for passenger ships is about 6 to 8, for freighters is about 5 to 7 and tugboats is about 3 to 5. So a large length to breadth value is favorable for speed, but unfavorable for maneuverability and stability. Uh, if you talk about length to depth ratio, then the customary values for the length to depth ratio vary between 10 and 15. And this relation plays a role in the determination of the freeboard and the longitudinal strength. 
Uh, then if you talk about the breadth to draft ratio that varies between 2 and 4.5 a large breadth in relation to the draft uh, gives a greater initial stability. Uh, this is another example of a ship with a small depth uh, because the breadth to depth ratio it varies between 1 and 2. If this value becomes larger uh, it will have an unfavorable effect on the stability of the vessel because the deck edge will be emerged when the vessel heals and also affects on the strength of the vessel. Now the size of why I'm talking about all this is because I'm going into the gross tonnage and net tonnage and uh, I want to talk about the size of a ship uh, can be expressed by using terms which describe the characteristics of the ship. So each term has a specific abbreviation. So the type of ship determines the term to be used. For instance, the size of a container vessel is expressed in the number of 20 feet containers it can hold or a row carrier size is given by the total lane meters and a passenger ship in the number of passengers it can carry. Now all aspects concerning the measurement of seagoing vessels are arranged in the Certificate of Registry Act of 1982. Now part of the Certificate of Registry Act is the International Treaty on the Measurement of Ships as set up by the IMO conference in 1969. Now the treaty applied to seagoing vessels on international voyages with a minimum length of 24 meters. Now at the IMO conference of 1969, the new measurements for the gross tonnage and net tonnage were introduced to establish a worldwide standard in calculating the size of a ship. Now in many countries, the gross tonnage is used to calculate harbor dues and pilotage or to determine the number of people in the crew. We also have a term called register tonnage. So to determine the size of a ship, the register tonnage is used. It is based on the volume where one register ton equals to 100 cubic feet or 2.83 meter cube. Now, if you look at the drawing here or look at the picture here, you can see clearly the areas which, def which are included in the calculation of gross tonnage and the areas that are included in the calculation of net tonnage and that is shown by the color coding. Now the gross tonnage also called as GRT is calculated using a formula that takes into account the ship's volume in cubic meters below the main deck and the enclosed spaces above the main deck. And I will not go into the formula in this slide here, uh, but I'll provide you with the link to my previous video where I've actually shown you the formula and shown you how to calculate it and what are the components and parameters that are included in the formula. So I will leave it out of that uh, this video here. Uh, but go and watch that video and you'll get an idea of the formula as well. Now, uh, you can see the gross tonnage. I'll come back to the gross tonnage and the gross tonnage volume is then multiplied by a coefficient which results in a non-dimensional number. This means uh, no values of tonnage or metric cube should be placed after the number. So all measurements used in the calculation are actually molded dimensions. Now, if you don't know what molded dimensions are, I have addressed it in my previous video uh, where I've talked about the principal dimensions of a ship. So you, there, from there, you can get an idea of molded dimensions are. Uh, so make sure you watch that video as well. The link to that video is also in the description section below. Now, in order to minimize the daily expenses of a ship, the ship owner will keep the gross tonnage as low as possible. So one way of doing this is by keeping the depth small so more cargo can be placed on deck. And that is why I was explaining all those terms before the depth and the length to depth ratio and the length and breadth to depth ratio because I was kind of setting it up for uh, explaining how the gross tonnage uh, is calculated and how it affects the, uh, the commercial aspects of shipping. Now, uh, I come back to what I was telling before that one way of keeping the gross tonnage uh, as low as possible is by keeping the depth small so more cargo can be placed on deck. Now, this strategy is in particular used in container feeder ships. Now, as a consequence, dangerous situations can occur as the loss of reserve buoyancy can result in a loss of stability and more water on deck. So because the depth is low, it's easier in rough seas for the water or the seas to be shipped on deck and that might be a bit complicated. Also happens on timber carriers as well sometimes because uh, they have low freeboard and because of that, uh, a lot of shipping sea sprays can take place. So that is one problem with the gross tonnage. Uh, we come now, I'll talk about net register tonnage. And again, in the picture here, you can see which are the areas that are included in the net register calculation. Now the net register tonnage is also a non-dimensional number that describes the value of the cargo space. So what is a non-dimensional number? That means uh, that number is not followed by any tons 
or metric cube after the number. So that's what we mean by non-dimensional number. So the net register tonnage is derived from the gross tonnage by subtracting the volume of space occupied by the crew, the navigation equipment and the propulsion equipment, uh, partly the propulsion equipment, also any kind of if there is any workshops or ballast tanks. So the net register tonnage uh, may not be less than 30% of the gross tonnage. It has to be more than the 30% of the gross tonnage. All right. And you can see here in the pictures how in the picture itself, how the areas that are included in the net register tonnage uh, basically comprise of spaces which are not occupied by the crew or navigation equipment or the propulsion equipment or workshops or ballast tanks. It's basically of the cargo carrying capacity. So that is what uh, defines the net register tonnage. It is the cargo carrying capacity. So I thought I'll make this video because often uh, students get confused as to which are the spaces that are included in the calculation of net register tonnage and which are the ones which are included in the gross tonnage. There's always this confusion and never it is cleared up. So I thought I'll make this video today and so that your doubts are cleared up. You can see what is actually included. Also watch my other video on gross tonnage and net tonnage. So the concept is very clear, especially if you are going for any kind of oral examinations or in the written examinations as well, it may be very useful. So I'll stop the video here and let me know what you thought about this video. I look forward to your feedback. Bye for now.